Pursuing politics on the trade union worker card here to get elected. Well, I mean, my, my agenda as a trade unionist has been to fight for worker rights and worker issues and worker dignity in the workplace. And I think I'll be pursuing my election to parliament largely on the basis. You've tried this a couple of times before, haven't you? I believe in 1999 and 2001. That so, is correct. Yeah, so what's different this time round? Well, at that time, you know, as you know, we had an alternative vote system in Fiji under which, you know, one could only enter parliament, you know, with the majority of the votes in a constituency. The system now offers better opportunity. And also at the same time, I think the political environment is such that trade unions like me who have been, you know, vocal and standing up to the dictatorship, you know, from day one are recognized as people, you know, uh, who have been principled in their belief and approach. And I think it is time that people recognize that the role I played. And I'm sure that the people would recognize it and, and vote. And do you have enough time before the elections with the whole registration process as a candidate and stuff? Well, I mean, you know, for... I'm sufficient. But I think three months is a reasonable time, although the obstacles, if any, would be found in the, in the actual electoral system and the ballot papers that are being used. But I think we have to find ways to, to, to work around them. The former head of the Fiji Council of Trade Unions, Atta Singh, speaking to Jamie Tahana. A publisher in French Polynesia says a plan to move a proposed fish farm project from Makemo to Hao Atoll is a more viable option for its Chinese investors. Three months ago, the French Polynesian government signed a deal with Tianrui International Investment for the aquaculture project on Makemo, which would see investments worth 1.7 billion US dollars and to creation of about 2,000. Somalia for testing, it has a 3,000 meter runway and a large stop. It would mean easy transportation of <laughs> from a came on. He told Mary Banks there is also talk of the atoll becoming a tax haven. The government will certainly declare the area a tax haven where they would be outside of the French Polynesian legal system which is bureaucratic. So many laws and regulations that you can hardly raise your finger without getting a permission. So that would be the only way that this operation would be viable by number one making a duty free zone, number two flying directly from that atoll to China and also having the docks because that would be another 30 or 40 million million dollars to build docks on the island of Makimo. And the uh, lagoon is much bigger also, and it's appropriate for the type of fishing they want to do. Is there concern about having a fisheries project there because of the nuclear pollution on how? This is my personal opinion. Effectively, there's an area where they used to have the shop, we used to have the power plant, where they used to Effectively, there's one area where they used to have the shop, they used to have the power plant, where they used to have a bunch of housing, and also they had, at the beginning, they had some kind of a factory that was making the hydrogen to blow up the balloons under which they would hang the bomb to have it explode. That actually the lagoon is so big and the area where the army was is so small that most of the lagoon must not have any pollution. 
There is one small area where they were washing the planes that flew through the nuclear clouds to take samples, and another place they had done a couple of these jets because they were too highly radioactive. But people know where they are. Yes. So what would the local reaction be to moving the aquaculture project to Hull? Would it be welcome? The people in Hull are jumping with joy, and the people on Mackinac are crying uh, their tears all the way down. There's nothing else to do on Hull. So if they have the same with tremendous investments, because they need at least seven hectares, and up their laboratories to send up the hatcheries and so on and so on. It will give a lot of work to the people and finally that atoll will wake up again. Even how we had a lot of traffic with the area nuclear test and then it kind of dropped so it would give them a second boost. Alistair Pearl, the publisher of the T Pacific Monthly, speaking to Mary Banks. And that ends trade winds for this week. The program was engineered by Myra O and presented by me, Walter Smythel, in the Wellington... For this week, the program was engineered by Myra O and presented by me, Walter Zweifel, in the Wellington studios of Radio New Zealand International. Biggie Mai Kakumai and welcome to Our Changing World from Radio New Zealand National. Scientists are using one of New Zealand's most toxic lakes as a natural laboratory to study bacteria that could threaten water supplies globally. Cyanobacteria are a type of photosynthetic microbe. They live everywhere, from scalding geothermal springs to ice-covered Antarctic lakes. Unfortunately, the of trying to make out why. Fifteen minutes' from Kaikoura on the muddy shore of Lake Rotorua, a small team of scientists have set up a makeshift laboratory. Standing by a pontoon jetty encrusted with scientific equipment, Waikato University's Professor David Hamilton is admiring the waters of the lake, stained in lurid green by billions upon billions of cyanobacteria. What we've got are almost the perfect conditions to form the blue. Very, very calm. We're actually just getting a light wind that's... We've got are almost the perfect conditions to form the bloom. Very, very calm. We're actually just getting a light wind that's pushing all of these cells, these buoyant cells, actually into the bay that we're, we were standing at the moment. You can almost see them moving into the bay, <laughs> can't you? Yeah. It just looks sort of like a, a green oil slick almost. That's almost exactly what it is. That's a particular feature of the cyanobacteria and this group in particular that, that makes these so spectacular. It's spectacular in a good and a bad sense in a way that these are the organisms that have been on the planet for nearly four billion years and it's almost as if they occasionally give you a reminder that they're the first and the, the most sort of visible of the microscopic organisms. Can you give an idea of sort of how much toxin there has been produced just in these little scums? <laughs> when you go down to a cellular level, you're re really talking about tiny toxins. You've got what we call telescoping. The cells all accumulate at the surface. And then they get pushed into the bay, and so they concentrate further. And then there seems to be some ability of the cells when they aggregate to actually start and ramp up their toxin production. By the time you concentrate these up, probably millions of fold, then you've actually got quite high concentrations in the bays. And this is the reason why. A, in this particular case, a dog jumped into the water and sort of started taking in a litre or two and potentially it would, it would die if it swallowed all of this. So if you went swimming in here, probably you'd get a reasonably nasty rat. ...and potentially it would, it would die if it, it swallowed all of this. And if you went swimming in here, probably you'd get a reasonably nasty rash. So there are sort of three possibilities for the way that these toxins act. And one of them is a dermatoxin, which is a toxin of the skin. Another one is um, a hepatotoxin, a toxin of the liver. The other one is a, a neurotoxins, and you might have heard of those in relation to shellfish poisoning. These ones here they are mostly hepatotoxins. This is a very, very similar sort of looking scum to what we see out in um, Lake Taihu in China.